Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The believers in their mutual love, mercy, and compassion are like one body. If one organ complained, the rest of the body is in pain." Is this hadith something that is being reflected within the Muslim community? Why is this, and what can we do to strengthen ties within the community and with the non-Muslim community? Well, to find out more, stay tuned for another Women's AM. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear sisters, and welcome to Women's AM. It's the show that brings you news, discussion, tips, and much more. We're live, of course, from my London studios. In today's show, we have our roundup of the day's stories of interest in News Bites, and we'll be kicking off her views with a dynamic discussion on community. I'm your host, Hassana, and on the panel joining me today is Sister Nazia, and our special guest today is Sister Saima Dowdy. Assalamu alaikum, sisters. Assalamu alaikum, sister. How are you both doing today? I'm good, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So sisters, of course we know summer holidays are fast approaching and this is the time of year where parents start to plan their holidays. So I was thinking, what are some family-friendly holiday tips that you could give in terms of organising and thinking about um, you know, the types of holidays that maybe parents should be looking into? Sister Nazia. I think when it comes to children, they have so much energy mm. that really for them it's a case of they need to burn that energy somehow. Definitely. And I know with my kids, especially like with my... Um, the younger ones, they're so active, mashallah, that they tend to want to do the kind of activities that will actually help them with that, uh, sort of get, taking all that energy out. So, you know, like things like hiking, ca camping, things like that. So I think it depends on the actual nature of the child. Like my eldest, she's just so mellowed back and relaxed. But <laughs> I think she does tend to like have a meltdown when we do those kind of activities. Yeah. And she'll be the first to say, no, I refuse to do this. But, <laughs> but you have to find a balance as well between everyone it, being able to do all the things that they want. And I think some of the things that maybe parents might not consider or maybe families might not consider is the fact that when you kind of make the arrangements for holidays everybody sort of thinks about one particular person in mind or maybe not the whole broad spectrum of people that are there so I think yeah look at the personalities of everyone there should be something for everyone, everyone exactly like, even for yourselves of course Absolutely, as well the parents yeah. too included <laughs> sister Saima what are some of the tips you would recommend um, I do agree with uh, sister Nazia that everyone should be taken into consideration but I think um, maybe look for something that will offer something different for everyone like it is the maybe the emphasis should be on doing something different so maybe coming out of your comfort zone the children coming out mm -hmm. of their comfort zone and um, seeing something that they don't normally uh, see and, and being in an environment that they're not normally in. It will help them adapt, help them become a bit stronger, a bit more resilient, mm -hmm. you know, like not everything being so comfortable. You know, so it's a character building experience. <laughs> you know, I, just talking about mm. character building experiences, I remember the best family holidays I ever had mm. were, were actually like a really local places. So I think we went to Lake District once, we went mm. to Ireland, mm. and it was really weird. Alhamdulillah, it was so nice. You know, all the family kind of stayed together, and, mm. and we went hiking. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, just actually sitting together and just spending the whole evening mm -hmm. just talking. And I think those are the best memories that I actually yeah. have of family holidays mm -hmm. because, alhamdulillah, it's really nice. You know, you're kind of away from the stresses yeah. of, of, of day-to-day -day routines and yeah. I think kids really enjoy that just their parents attention yeah. and their focus and also look at uh, things that they could learn from as well mm. like I know one particular holiday destination they actually got to see how glasses uh, you know how glass uh, objects are made you know I would like to do that actually That's really good actually <laughs> some great tips there. well let's go to our first segment of the show now it's news bites In this segment, we take a look at the day's stories of interest and discuss what's been happening around the world. And of course, we'd love for you to join in our discussion on the stories we're talking about. You can call in live to the show. The number is on your screens, inshallah. So, Sister Nazia, talk us through your first story, inshallah. Um. My first article is taken from The Telegraph. Um, Islamic law is adopted by British legal chiefs. So Islamic law is to be effectively enshrined in the British legal system for the first time under the guidelines for solicitors on drawing up Sharia compliant wills. So you can imagine this has now been big news. Yes, big, well, there's a barrage of criticisms that have come as a result of this because obviously one of the issues that's been raised is that the fact that um, women will not be able to get equal share of inheritance. Um, a crossbench peer observed, it, this violates everything that we stand for, she said. It would make the suffragettes turn in their graves. Now, 
When I saw this, I mean, to be honest, this could be about m a lot of things within Islam. What happens is a lot of blanket statements are made about certain things within Islam without actually understanding the context or the full, or even giving the full information regarding an issue. And I find that really frustrating. If you look at the inheritance issue, yes, you know, women do not get equal share, but the inheritance, the way that it is split, the reason men get a greater share, it's because it's in lieu of the fact that they have a greater responsibility. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. They have greater responsibility in terms of having to look after the women, in terms of looking after their families. And this could uh, also extend to their mothers and any unmarried um, uh, sisters as well. So when you actually look at it objectively, who really benefits from this? Even though the woman has a, a lower proportion, actually her inheritance, no one can touch it. It's for her own personal ownership. She can dispose of it and do whatever she wants with it. Whereas the man, the likelihood he will end up spending his share within the, the responsibilities that he has. But more important than this, I think what gets lost in the whole thing is the fact that Islamic wills have been able to, the whole issue of inheritance is something that has allowed women to be able to inherit for the last 1400 years. Absolutely. This is something um, European women, they did not have that. And actually even today, there are sections of society where they cannot inherit. Because I mentioned this a few months back about the Downton Bill, where in the upper classes, they still have old laws by which daughters cannot in inherit titles, estates and wealth from their fathers. And in fact, the estates get entailed away to a uh, distant male relatives. And it could be someone like a 12th cousin down the family tree. So the point is that you can see there's still issues there. When you look at the other social stratas, generally the inheritance laws across England and Wales, but the principle is anyone can leave their will to whoever they please. So imagine a situation where you can choose whoever you want to leave to. Actually, then it makes the family's position very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we do hear stories where families are disinherited. Children, this is. They get disinherited. Um, you hear uh, uh, the, form, the, the manner by which inheritance is actually spread across is through favoritism even. And in extreme cases, you know, you've heard where inheritance has even been left to a family cat. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when there's no clear guidelines in terms of who should inherit. So in terms of actually to suggest, actually the Islamic will is such an amazing thing that when you look about, look at the consequences, there's so much there's so much fitna that comes into a family when inheritance is not managed properly yeah, and absolutely. it can cause family feuds breaking of ties this is the wisdom behind the actual inheritance and when you will actually find the Islamic will it actually roots out all forms of discrimination not just gender but also any other kind of discrimination that could potentially rise potential sibling uh, yeah. rivalry and the fact mm -hmm. of the matter is is that these kind of um, when people try to understand the context, what they will actually find is that Allah's laws actually agree with yeah. human nature. They Definitely. really do. Well, really, really interesting article there. Jazakallah khair for sharing that, Sister Nazia. Sister Saima, you've got another interesting article yeah. for us. Uh, do share, inshallah. Uh, Bismillah, this is in The Guardian. Um, basically, um, a Jordanian uh, mechanical engineer, a sister, she graduated from university and immediately got uh, married and had children. Uh, what happened though, she had, she's basically an example. When, when I read this story, it reminded me of Khadija radiallahu anha because um, she fulfilled her, she's fulfilling her role as mother, as wife, um, but her husband, when they moved to Saudi Arabia, he was working and in the same field and she stopped working, but he was receiving enough work for both of them to, to partake in. So what she did is that she returned back to Jordan and to take on a major project, a solo project after that. Um, so still doing her role as, um, not, not neg neglecting her role as mother or as wife. So when she arrived back in Jordan, she needed some help though for this new bigger project. Um, and then she put out a seven word ad in a newspaper and she got a response of 700 wow. from 700 women yeah so I guess um, this story is looking at the benefits and the positive side of freelance work and um, so basically a sister can obviously she is allowed to work in Islam as long as her fundamental roles and responsibilities are not being neglected um, but this allows her freelancing allows her then to balance um, her various responsibilities mm -hmm. and duties quite well and I, something that struck me is that I didn't actually realize panala because um, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, I always perceive that as being a very male-dominated industry. Mm. That is amazing that 700 women in Jordan were able to respond to that advert, i.e. they're qualified. 
um, I find that astounding. I think that's really, really amazing. It's, it bears testimony to the greatness in this ummah and uh, the greatness in women, that women, subhanAllah, even in difficult parts of the world, um, living in situations that, uh, of difficulty in different parts of the world, are still excelling academically. MashaAllah, it's brilliant. Alhamdulillah. Well, really, really interesting mm. article there. And we actually have a caller on the line. So let's talk to Brother Sam. He's calling from London. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Alaikum salam. Brother, I believe you have a comment for us, inshallah. Yes, I do have a comment. Please do go ahead, inshallah. Um, in regards to how to respond to the, uh, the statement in the Telegraph uh, when they said that it is wrong to um, give half a portion to female and a full portion to the male. Do they understand the concept like the sister explained, as all Muslims do know why uh, Allah has uh, distributed it in that even way? Um, because women actually benefit more than the men because women's portion doesn't get touched at all, does it? It's the men that have to provide and spend for the whole uh, wider family. Um, Absolutely. Jazakallah khair, uh, brother, for your call there. I think, you know, just touching on a point you made, Sister Nazi, alhamdulillah, it's good to hear it from a brother's point of view as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think this is why it's really important that when people listen to things about Islam, the whole context has to be brought into it. Absolutely. And I think that's the reality, that people don't. They just take things on face value and you really need to look really into mm. it to understand what the dynamics here is and there is an answer absolutely um, and uh, you know of course you know the brother was raising the question how should we respond to this and the truth of the matter is you know we can only respond to things when we kind of look into these matters yeah. ourselves we have to educate ourselves we do and, and we, we have, have to understand the context it's important to too. engage as well in the discussion mm. and not shy away from it Definitely. and absolutely. that's something we need to really be able to do Alhamdulillah, yeah. jazakallah khair for that. I've got an interesting article here. It's from the Daily Mail. It's a bit of a, a light-hearted one. The headline is, Don't bother asking your man to clean up. He'll only do half a job. Two-thirds of women still do the cleaning, even if their husbands say they've already done it. So this one um, is based on a study which has just come out which shows that six out of ten women wish their partner wouldn't help her, uh, around the house at all because they do it so badly. So um, the study is just kind of researching into the, the kind of relationship, the strange relationship men have with household cleaning. Um, and I think, you know, lots of really funny things happening in this article, but the most funny statistic I came across was that four out of ten women believe leave their husbands purposely cleaned really, really badly so that they wouldn't be asked to do it again. And it got me thinking, actually, and I wonder if my brothers are doing this, because, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes when I ask them, on the rare occasion I ask them to do something, they'll sweep and they'll, you know, they'll do such a, a kind of a botched job of it that I end up going around after them myself and, and repeating the job all over again. Um, and they actually talked about lots of uh, common cleaning cheats that men do. So apparently men often push the rubbish further down into a full bin rather than emptying it. They live, leave big smears when cleaning the mirrors. Um, they squirt bleach down the toilet instead of cleaning it. Um, they ignore the recycling system and they pick up bits off the floor instead of hoovering. So uh, quite a, a strange story there, but yeah, quite interesting a indeed. Ago, we, had, we, we had a discussion on Ihsan, yeah? About doing things yeah. in an excellent manner. You should have that discussion with your brothers. There we go. And of course, you know, it reminded me of the fact that if we look at the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Mm. We know that actually he was very, very active within the household. And, um, you know, there's a, um, a hadith where Aisha radiallahu anha, she actually said he was like any other human being who'd clean his clothes and serve himself. He used to serve his family. And then when the time for prayer came, he would go out and pray. So definitely an example for, for all of us, alhamdulillah. I think it's just really, really interesting, this article. And actually, you know, quite funny as well. Mm. I think I might, I might uh, you know, slip it to my brothers there uh, underneath <laughs> the, the dinner uh, plate today. So it's something for them to read, inshallah. Mm. <laughs> alhamdulillah. So a really interesting article there, sisters. I mean, what, what, what do you take? What's your take on this, Nazia? I think it's uh, quite a humorous one, isn't it? 